I'm not going to say we saved the best for last because everybody else has been so awesome. Um, but uh, we're really happy to have uh, Chip here uh, today to talk not just about Airbnb, but the guest experience. And one of the reasons we asked Chip is um, because of his deep experience uh, working with guests and, and, and customer experience. And we wanna, I want to start off a bit with um, your previous life and talking a bit about kind of what you learned with working with guests and guest satisfaction um, at, at, at George Beaver Hotels. Sure. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know, because I'm a West Coast guy, I started a hotel company, a hotel company called Joie de Vivre. Uh, that was in 1987. Grew it to 52 boutique hotels over the course of about 25 years running that company. And um, I still actually own 18 hotels. I sold the management company, but I still own 18 hotels. So I'm a hotelier as well as an Airbnb executive, which is in, in two interesting hats. Uh, and really prided ourselves on providing a guest experience in a boutique hotel that was quite unique. And we, we won some awards and uh, the best customer satisfaction of any upper upscale hotel company in the US in 2010. So I, I think what's common or, or what's similar between a boutique hotel and Airbnb is uh, three key things. Number one is boutique hotels grew. I was really appreciating Avi's presentation earlier, who I've, I've known Avi for a while. Boutique hotels really were all about living like a local. How do you have an experience that feels like a local experience? And the way you did that in a boutique hotel was the food and beverage experience. You don't usually see a whole lot of locals at a Marriott restaurant in a hotel, but you do see that in a boutique hotel. Uh, secondly, um, it was about having a design point of view. So the place didn't feel generic. Uh, in, a, in a chain hotel, that can, it can feel that way. In a boutique hotel, it didn't. And thirdly, it was about actually turning strangers into friends and building a relationship with the staff. And that, that's, in fact, that's why we called our staff at our boutique hotels in Joie de Vivre hosts. Well, all three of those things relate to Airbnb, too. It's about living like a local. That's why people tend to like to stay at an Airbnb. Quite often, you're staying in a neighborhood. If you're coming to, to, uh, to New York, you're often staying in Brooklyn. And you're actually staying in Williamsburg. And you're staying in a place where you get to know locals. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at where the hotels are in New York versus where the Airbnb uh, listings are, quite different. You don't see a lot of hot, uh, Airbnb listings in Times Square, and you don't see a lot of hotels in Brooklyn. Secondly, the uh, idea of a design point of view, absolutely. I mean, it's people's homes. So there's definitely a point of view. It's not meant to be generic. Uh, and so that's the second piece. And then thirdly, we do call the people who run an Airbnb listing a host. And that's because they are, in essence, opening their home. And so there's a lot of similarities. I would just say that when I started in boutique hotels, about three or four years after Ian Schrager and Bill Kimpton got started, it was a disruptive, it was a disruptor in the hotel industry. And then it became, over time, something that's you know, very much seen as part of the industry. And Airbnb is doing the same thing. And so it's a disruptor now. But over time, I think it's becoming more and more clear that it's, a, it's, it's here to stay. Now that a lot of um, major hotel chains have got into, you know, having a boutique line or you know boutique-like properties, or even Kimpton's gotten much larger, um, has that? Do you think it's watered down that type of guest experience and and given you more opportunities at, at Airbnb and, and and similar services? No, I mean, I think actually I'm, I'm not as fatalistic as obvious <laughs> um, in terms of where boutique hotels are. I I really respect him. He's in, he's intensely good at what he does. Uh, I think the fact that the hotel industry has embraced boutique hotels and that virtually every low, large global hotel brand has its own boutique uh, uh, sub-brand is a good sign. Um, I think it's, in some ways it's hard to define what a boutique hotel is anymore because of that. Uh, but I think what, what people, the reason people are really flocking to Airbnb um, you know, I'm just this, like this last week, we had about 450,000 people staying in an Airbnb listing around the world. So it's like the city of New Orleans staying in Airbnbs on any one particular night. A lot of it has to do with the fact that it, it's a digital experience. That from start to finish, we, are, we, we sort of control the digital experience at Airbnb with a big team that does that. And it's really easy to book it. It's easy to find lots of choices. And virtually anywhere in the world, you'll find an Airbnb listing. And I think that's part of it. So you can't, trying to create boutique hotels and stamp them out and put them around the world, I've done it. It's hard as hell. And it takes a lot of time. Right. 
But um, so I, I'd say that's part of it. And I think, I, I think the, the hotel industry is still doing just as great of a job as they've always done in providing service. But sometimes people aren't looking for the ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, which is the Ritz Carlton experience. I can promise you that at Airbnb, we don't teach our hosts to be ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. We, turn, we basically teach our hosts how to actually create a stranger into a friend. And that's what many people are looking for, is the informality, the casualness, and the opportunity to feel like they can belong anywhere, which is really our sort of our mantra. So you talked about having you know, properties all over the world, which is hard to do if you're building boutique hotels. Um, but in the same way, if you're a hotel, you can control so much of the yeah. guest experience. How do you then, you can scale rapidly, but how do you scale that guest experience in the same way? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a curious, strange guy. And so I'm 53 years old. I turned 54 later this month. And I was going to go join a company that, where I was twice the age as the average employee in this company. And it was a technology company that wanted to be a hospitality company. But I wasn't sure at first. Like, do they really want to be a hospitality company, or is that just window dressing? No, what I saw quickly uh, when Brian Chesky, the CEO, approached me a year and a half ago to, to join, is what I saw is here's a company that gets that if they're going to be a revolutionizing organization in the long run, it's not because they're known for their technology. It's going to be because they've actually created a democracy in hospitality. They have democratized in a grass, grassroots way the idea of hospitality. So. I, I wear a lot of hats. I wear, I'm the head of hospitality, head of business development, head of, head of strategy for the company. But the hospitality side of it was the one that made me most curious and fascinated. Because how do you teach 600, 700,000 hosts around the world about the art and science of hospitality? So the way we've done it, we've do it we're doing it in a variety of ways. We had to start by saying, OK, there are some basic standards. And we went out and researched with our hosts and our guests. What were the things that most created a moment of truth for a guest? Uh, and we ultimately came up with nine uh, standards that we had to, to define. And we now measure our hosts on how they're doing on these standards. And just, just three weeks ago, we uh, launched our super host program. Or we, really, we relaunched it. And about 5% of our hosts around the world actually became super hosts. And frankly, it's going to help them in search. It's going to help them in terms of get more business. And frankly, it's going to help the guest who says, I want a quality of experience that's higher than maybe what would be the average Airbnb experience. And so it's helping with that as well. So we're doing that, and then we're doing a whole bunch of other things. I'll tell you in a few minutes. And I think you have another question that you might ask about this, about how we're actually taking that uh, and scaling it. But at the end of the day, um, what we're trying to do is help our hosts realize that if they want to actually make more money uh, and have better search results, they have to actually do a better job of providing the service. But our NPS scores, so there's, a, there's a something called Net Promoter Score NPS. Are you familiar with that? So it's, it's, a, it's the, sort of the primary way that most of the global hotel companies uh, evaluate themselves. So our NPS scores as a company are comparable to the eight of the 10 largest global hotel companies in terms of what the customer satisfaction is. So we're actually starting from a place where we're at, at parity with the global brands, and we've just started our training and education efforts of our, train, of our hosts. As, as there's more awareness of Airbnb among potential hosts and others, or as laws changed like in San Francisco th earlier this week that remove some doubt and make it more attractive. Right. Um, you'll have more guests and you'll have more hosts. How do you, how do you bring these kind of late comers along? Um, because they won't be the same as the early adopters. Um, and what's, what are some of the hurdles with getting them up to speed to be good hosts and good guests? You know, some the of the latecomers, way. what's interesting is some of the people who initially you know, Airbnb started in 2008, started with, in two, actually in 2007, uh, two of the three founders basically opened their apartment and, and put three air mattresses on the floor during a hotel con or a design convention in San Francisco because there were no rooms in San Francisco. And that's how they started, uh, because they needed to make some money to pay their rent. Uh, it's come a long way since then. But it started. So they, they would have been terrible hosts, right? They, well, <laughs> by they actually, current standards. <laughs> by current standards, yes, probably. But in 08 and 09, a lot of people got into Airbnb because we had a, the, the economic climate we had. And right. so whether you're a host or you're a guest, you're looking to make some money because you needed to, or you're looking to actually get cheap accommodations. What's happened over time is that the, one of our fastest growing segments of hosts in the world right now are empty nesters. 
people 50 and older, I'm 53, 54, people like me who have had two kids or three kids, they've moved out, they want to stay in their home, they actually got laid off last year, and at 55 or 60, it's really hard to find a new job, and they've got a three-bedroom home. And they say, well, I could actually become an Airbnb host, and I can actually just become the innkeeper that I always imagined maybe when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who fit that profile, and those people, we're having an Airbnb open next month where we're inviting all of our global hosts to San Francisco for a two or three day uh, training and education and sort of inspirational celebration. And it's been amazing, the average age of the people who are coming is 45 years old. This is not about just you know, millennials you know, who are in their 20s. This is our average age of our host coming to this is 45 years old. So I, I, the nature of Airbnb is changing and evolving and some of the people who are getting involved today are more serious they, now that we're actually being more legitimate in terms of legislation uh, in certain cities, it's actually bringing out the parents of the millennials right. <laughs> who are saying, I actually think I can do that as well. Right. What, what's some of the knowledge that was, so, was, was much easily imported from your previous role as a hotelier into, into Airbnb in terms of guest experience? Like, you know, we need to hit these marks right away. Yeah. Um, well, one, uh, you know, so in creating uh, Joie de Vivre and creating 52 boutique hotels over time, we had a approach to how we create each hotel. We imagined so boutique hotels and um, magazines are quite similar. So if you think about it, boutique hotels are niche-oriented and they're lifestyle-oriented, and many magazines are the same. So every time we created a hotel, it was based upon a magazine. So the Phoenix Hotel, my first hotel, uh, was Rolling Stone magazine, and it was irreverent, adventurous, funky, uh, young at heart, uh, and, some, and one of the fifth word I can't think of right now. Every time we actually sit down and get to know our new hosts, we say, you have a psychographic or a demographic of people who are going to love your property. So let's get clear on who you are. Uh, what's the magazine that defines your, your listing? And then let, how do you write your listing in such a way that people understand what that is? Because one of the things that we can do at, at Airbnb is we can understand through data science what a guest is looking for, what kind of design they like, if they've stayed with us three or four times in other places, how they rated each experience. Using that, we can actually match people really well. But we can only match them well if your listing that you've created as a host is accurate. And, is, and so part of what we try to do is help our, our hosts understand that being accurate is the first step toward actually making sure you don't have disappointment. So that's one thing. Another thing, you know, something we used to do in the hotel, to, uh, the boutique hotel business, is usually with at our, especially at our mid-priced hotels or higher, within 15 minutes after a person checked into the room, we'd have the front desk check in with you by calling you in the room, saying, "Does everything look okay?" And the reason we do that is because about 80 to 85 percent of guests, if they have a small to minor problem, never call the front desk. But actually, by calling you 15 minutes after you've been in the room, we can figure out if something's wrong. Similarly, we train and help our hosts understand. If you're going to have a guest stay for five days, and that's the average length of stay for our, our guests is about five days, so it's about double the average for the hotel industry. Uh, within the first 12 hours after the guest has arrived, check in with them. Write them a little note and say, you have any questions about the city? Um, what are some things you want to do? And does everything look okay in the listing? And that's just something we learned in the hotel business because by actually showing up, then the guest feels a little bit more open to actually saying, yeah, there's something I don't know. It's taking two minutes to get hot water in the shower. Is there something else I'm supposed to do? Right. How do you provide then that, that, that consistent guest experience? Um, and you've touched on this a bit, but you know, when, when you don't control anything beyond the booking. Well, I, you know, consistent, we will never beat the hotel industry for consistency because I think consistency is, is about predictability. But what we can try to do it, relative to the hotel industry is actually be the best at dependability. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between consistency and dependability. Consistency is expecting something, and, and wherever you go in Holiday Inn, it's the same thing over and over again. Dependability uh, is based upon an equation which is disappointment equals expectations minus reality. <laughs> disappointment equals expectations minus reality. It's about affecting expectations and reality. So dependability means you understand what you're going to get, and that, a lot, that has a lot to do with how the host wrote their listing um, and how we've set it up in such a way so you, you actually aren't going to be surprised. And then it's also the reality piece. How do we help our hosts be better at what they do? So the nine standards that we've created are, is one way to do that. And being able to tell our hosts on their dashboard 
that you are, you think you're doing well at cleaning because you have a 4.4 rating out of five, but in your market in Knoxville, uh, you're actually at the 37th percentile at 4.4. So helping a host know that, that they actually could use some improvement and then giving them some education and tools to, to, to learn more is part of how we're doing that. So you know, for, for many people, um, even critics of Airbnb, your website is something that everybody loves. It's like, you know, big pictures, inspiring, things like that. What role does the digital experience play in the guest experience from the discovery to the booking to the reviews? Yeah. Uh, how crucial is that? Well, because two, because two of the three uh, founders are from the design industry. They uh, went to the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, we have it all in-house, so we really do, from start to finish, we have the whole team, designers, producers, engineers in-house. Uh, we have a lot of respect for HomeAway uh, in terms of how they've grown. We've had very different approach to, to growing. Ours has been really pretty much all in-house and brand-driven, and theirs has been very much uh, a, an acquisition strategy around the world. F because we've done it in-house, sometimes it takes longer to get done, uh, but it means there's a, a cohesiveness in the experience. You know, our review system, 78% uh, of our hosts and guests review each other. Now, if you're a hotelier in the room, you know that if 20% of your guests fill out the customer satisfaction report, you know, the online one, that's pretty good. But when you have 78%, what you've built is you've built a community. And our hosts, uh, I heard the question earlier about TripAdvisor, how, you know, hoteliers wanting to actually review their guests. Well, that's what our hosts get to do. Our hosts get to review their guests, and their guests get to review the host. And that's what creates the, the trust in the platform. And, and, and your reputation as a, as a host or as a guest is a function of how people feel about you and their, the experience they've had with you. So the fact that 78% of our guests and hosts actually do that, and we do it in-house. The hotel industry, in essence, outsourced it to TripAdvisor, mm -hmm. which wasn't a very good idea for the hotel industry, um, but great for TripAdvisor. Uh, so I think the fact we've tried to actually do it all inclusively has at times been incredibly ambitious but I think as we've gotten bigger, it's actually working to our favor. Um, so on Tuesday, was it Tuesday? Uh, San Francisco passed the, the Airbnb friendly law, which um, in some respects it was friendly, in some respects it probably doesn't feel friendly in, in, in other things. But um, how do you think that will, as cities normalize yep. their relationship with short term rentals, either normalize them or ban them outright, how do you think the, the kind of setting of clear standards will affect? that guest experience and, and, and host as well. Uh, I was, when we were off stage, I was saying there's a g great Gandhi quote. And when I started at Airbnb a year and a half ago, I actually quoted Gandhi when I, when I first talked to the, to the whole company. And Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then you win. Uh, <laughs> that's how we feel right now. We feel like we're winning. Um, and what does that mean? It means that. Uh, as, as the San Francisco Chronicle said in an interview, in, the, in a editorial, I think yesterday, they've not been all that supportive generally, but they said basically, this isn't going away, um, and you know, Airbnb is here to stay. Home sharing is a long-term phenomenon. So how do we moderate it? How do we make sure we manage it in a way that's good for society? Places like Brazil managed it such that the, the, the whole state, many states in Brazil asked us to come to Brazil during World Cup to create Airbnb lodging because they didn't have enough hotels. So there are 600,000 people who went to World Cup from other countries, and 120,000 of the 600,000 stayed at Airbnb listings. We had 20% of the market. No hotel company in the world was even in double digits. So long story short is, I think the normalization of this is going to mean there are more and more people who are hosts, who, are, who could be hosts, who would say, yes, I'll try that. Mm -hmm because our, our primary market is not secondary homes. Uh, our primary heart market is personal, you know, your, your personal space, your own home. And if you're a McKinsey consultant on the road 12 weeks a year, maybe you should actually lease your place out, you rent your place out while you're gone. Um, if you're going on vacation, as Australians go on vacation for three weeks at a time, that's what they do. That's our, our biggest market share in the world is in Australia because Australians go for a long time and they pay for their trip by actually renting out their place while they're gone. So. Uh, and outside of the guest and the host with with Airbnb and other uh, short-term and vacation rental sites, sometimes you have the third party, which is a landlord or yep. even a neighbor to a certain extent. How does that 
complicate matters? Yep. Um, and is that kind of your next challenge in improving the guest experience? Yeah, there, no doubt. One of the things that we need to do a better job of, and we are working on very aggressively now, is how do we build relationships with the community and, and neighbors and landlords in a way that they actually see us as a positive as opposed to a negative. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, what that means is making sure in, in the US, we, we've sent out th ten, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, fire, ex fire um, uh, smoke, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors free to our hosts just to provide a safer building. But also it means work, meet, work, uh, working face to face with landlords to say, what can we do? Some of it's liability insurance. We're really far along in terms of the process of actually getting a blanket liability insurance for hosts uh, uh, and for guests, uh, which would be another big step in the right direction. So I think that the, the more we actually focus on how, do we be a, how can we be a good neighbor, um, and we, we started basically in Portland with a model city campaign, working very closely with the mayor and their team there uh, on how do we actually, how do, do people look at us as a positive in their neighborhood as opposed to something that, you know, that scares them. Right. I'm going to open it up for questions. I think we probably have a few in the audience. Uh, we have mics on this side oh, and that side. Hello. Um, you spoke a lot about improving the guest experience through hosts. But then there have also been a lot of um, bad experiences that have gone viral. So how or what are you doing to improve like customer service? So maybe these incidences you know, don't have to go public in order to get a response from Airbnb. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last sentence. Uh, what are you doing to improve customer service so incidences like the squatters in, um, in California don't become a big news media story? Yeah, well, let's be clear. We're the si on any particular night, we have the size of New Orleans staying in any place. So you're going to have issues. Squatters happen in any city, and anybody staying 30 days or longer in California has rights that we can't actually mess with. So um, it does mean we've actually made some, some modifications in terms of actually how we're looking at uh, guests who are staying longer than 30 days. About 20% of our total room nights uh, annually is in people staying 30 days or longer. So that's a piece that a lot of people don't know is that a lot of the reasons that Airbnb has grown as big as it has is because a lot of the people who are staying are staying because they're actually relocating, a lot of corporate relocations. And so we get a lot of people who are staying longer. So we're, we're taking them as, as we can. But I will say, when you have 425, 450,000 people a night staying somewhere, you're going to have some issues that come up. It's actually sort of surprising we don't have more. But we're also um, major, major upgrading our um, our call center activities. So we have call centers all over the world. Um, at this point, something on the order of probably about five or 600 people in call centers uh, around the world at this point. So um, that is uh, a big step in the, uh, the right direction also. Because if you actually are on the road and something goes wrong, you want to be able to have somebody to be able to fix it immediately. So we've always had that, but we're actually in doubling down in terms of the investment in, in the call centers. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the motives behind Airbnb signing on with Conquer Technologies? Say, signing with what? With Conquer Technologies. Oh, Concur. 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 And yeah. sort of how they plan to cater to business travelers. Yeah, so, so let me uh, make sure everybody understands. So Concur is the largest run, uh, basically has about 85% of the market share for corporate travel management expense, travel expense management uh, online in the U.S., 70% um, of the Fortune 100 uh, companies actually use Concur. So we signed a deal with Concur this summer, and the integration will be complete approximately November 1, which means that companies who use Concur, and it's the predominant uh, site that most companies do use, can actually uh, keep track uh, and have what's called duty of care uh, for their employees, which means that they can know where their employees are at any one time, and all the expense management can actually be centralized. So it's, a, it's helping to legitimize uh, Airbnb in the business travel field. We will never compete with the Marriott or the Hilton that has the two-day road warrior who's going to come and check in and check out. We don't want that business. It's not our core business. And um, we, you know, we think Marriott and Hilton can always do that better. But there's a lot, of, a lot of other components of business travel where we already have a major foothold even before Concur happened. What, what are some examples of that? Well, in small SMBs, SMBs, small, medium businesses, these guys, they're people who are entrepreneurs on the road are very cautious about costs. They sometimes want more space. Uh, corporate relocations, people who are staying for extended stays, they want that. 
Um, we were on the Today Show yesterday uh, where they profiled three women who were in Austin going for a conference and they loved getting a three bedroom house because they could all stay in the same house. It was both more affordable, but they actually had a lot of common area space where they could actually enjoy. So those, that kind of business we already have, it represents a sizable part of our business and it will only get bigger over time. But for the road warriors who are just doing two days here, two days there, and want a loyalty program, that's just not us. We have time for one more question. Hello. Uh, in Europe, people list their places on booking.com. Will we see more and more boutique hotels on Airbnb? So, I'm sorry, it's... it's well. Will we see alternative, like, boutique hotels on Airbnb? Boutique hotels, so, haha, <laughs> good question. Um, one of the challenges we currently have is that when you go to the site, and I'm going to be honest about this, when you go to the site and you actually say, as a host, what kind of listing you have, we actually don't even have a hotel category because we've never thought that hotels would put their business on our site. And guess what? Hotels are putting their business on our site. So we need to get clearer about what's on, on the site because our primary business, we don't have any desire to be Expedia. Uh, we don't want to be an OTA. That's not our intention. Our primary business is helping people home share around the world. So yes, we do have hotels on the site. We have a lot of bed and breakfasts and small inns on the site. Um, the smaller the property, the more they're probably appropriate for the site. But over the next year, we're going to be a lot better at being able to police who's on the site as, as a listing and whether it's appropriate for them to be on the site. Uh, but a lot of hotels have been told by hotel consultants, put your hotel on Airbnb. It's the way you'll get millennials to stay with you. And um, I, I don't think that that's actually great advice uh, because you know, the bottom line is what most people are looking for when they're coming to Airbnb is they're like looking for a, a home sharing experience. Well, thank you, Chip. Yes, I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.